Louisiana is the largest producer of shrimp in the United States and oysters. And we were the first deemed sustainable crab fishery in the United States. I think we process about 45 million pounds a year on blue crab. And then the fin fish, I couldn't even tell you. We're very, very highly uh, ranked in terms of the fishing industry. However, the fishing industry is still very, very small in the Louisiana economy. It's probably less than a half a percent. We produce 50 percent of the nation's wild shrimp crop, 40 percent of the nation's oysters, 35 percent of its blue claw crabs come from right around here. So that's what we're losing. The engine that drives fishery production almost for the entire Gulf of Mexico. That's part of the New Orleans uh, culture also, the, the culinary cu culture and the seafood. So we have a lot to lose here. I think those that have power of pen don't care. Well, the bread and butter of this state is the oil and gas industry. If you look at this industry and look at the direct taxes they pay to the state of Louisiana, plus the taxes that the state collects because of the, all the economic activity they create, it's about $2 billion to our state budget. And so that is the biggest contribution by any sector of the state by, by a long measure. We have also refineries here. And we are the number two state in the nation in terms of refining capacity. The petroleum and oil and gas and related industries are really the backbone of the state. The fishing industry used to be a great industry. In this, in this area, you make money and, and, uh, and give your family a good living. Then foreign imports uh, started coming in. So what you, what you have is uh, the market flooded with foreign imports. You know, with the loss of habitat and the loss of just production, you know, fishermen, uh, it's just about, you know, I can see they they almost giving up. You know, we, we're looking at right now is uh, almost 80% uh, less shrimp coming in. I think it's just loss of habitat, you know, the main concern. But, you know, we have no more coast. Our coast is gone, you know, and we have nothing to stop the waters from coming in. I think my future is coming to the end. I, I really do believe it. How do you balance kind of what's happened historically versus what the residents need and what the communities need? It's one of those two-way things in Louisiana. You know, people talk about kind of the historical impact of oil and gas on the coast and some of the environmental impacts and whether or not it's related to land loss. Just uh, navigation channels, there's like 300 miles of navigation channels or there once was along the Louisiana coast. So those add to the land loss situation. This is all going, this is all dug by pipelines. This, this is all, the all companies came in and Filling for oil and all and that, and they just left it. Now they blame them on salt water coming in through them, the areas and canals and all, and killing out all the, the vegetation. All these canals that the, the oil companies came in and, and dug and dropped the wells there and, and left the canals open, even after the well was dead, it's still open. And, and what it does, it, it lets that uh, salt water come on faster and, and stronger than ever before. And when it's coming on that, that, that quick, it's actually eating more marsh away. And, and, uh, causing all that uh, ghost erosion. Uh, some of my research has su suggested that a lot of the, the sinking that we've had here in, south, in deep south Louisiana is due to oil and gas withdrawal. You pull out oil and gas, you're pulling out, some, you're pulling out a bunch of fluids. It's almost like you're drying out a sponge and the ground above it sinks. It was a thought it would get this bad. Nobody would ever thought it would be this bad, but... But, I'll tell you what, that water's coming, that's for sure. We know that's coming. The, the industry itself is primarily under attack. Um, from a legal standpoint. There are six parish lawsuits now that are um, directed at oil and gas companies that dug channels to put in uh, oil equipment and lines. Some of the parishes along the coast are suing the oil and gas companies for any role that they had in the coastal erosion issue. We have a, a law firm now that we're looking at to try to, uh, to file suit 
and, and try to uh, get them to do something about it if it's possible. The, the lawsuits have, have really been a pretty, I guess, controversial or divisive issue. Some people come in and say, you know what, the, these folks did dig the canals and it contributed to land loss and they need to pay. There absolutely is some culpability there. Uh, but they were they were permanent activities. Can you really come in and apply 2019 science and know-how to decisions that were made in 1950s, 1960s? The government caused our problem, and, and all companies caused our problem. And the government the government gave permits to all companies. They, they, they dug all those canals. Everybody, like I said, is woulda, shoulda, coulda. You, know? <laughs> you should have stopped it years ago. I mean, uh, but the. Uh, I'm sure the state, you know, profit a lot from the, all these oil drilling and all. And if it was our problem, and we caused it, or if we went down to a place and, and lived a place that flooded all the time, it'd be a different ballgame. The argument is that um, because of the channels, again, that led to saltwater intrusion, which um, killed plant life, and that plant life is what held the delta together. And this this money that they would potentially recoup would go towards restoring wetlands. And again, the governor's encouraging them to sue. And uh, uh, I mean, to me, it's like the dog biting the hand that feeds them. Because if you look at Plaquemine and Parish, what would Plaquemine and Parish look like today if there was no oil and gas activity in that parish? I mean, I, I, I showed her to think. For many years, 40% of the state's income came from oil and gas royalties. But in the last 10 years, uh, it's gone down about 14% because most of the work now is in federal waters offshore. It's not as big an industry as it used to be, but it's still very, very powerful. If you look at the drilling activity onshore South Louisiana, it's dropped to almost nothing now because oil companies are saying, well, we're not going to drill if that's going to be the attitude that you have down here. You know, they started this big giant PR campaign about how if we didn't eliminate the lawsuits that um, we wasn't going to get the work in Plaquemines. They see deep pockets and a potentially large settlement uh, that could help them out of any kind of financial issue or whatever they're having. So you have all of these oil and gas guys that are manipulating people all over southeast Louisiana through fear tactics. They don't want to pay for Dice Nymph the Marshes. Not only do they not want to pay, they never even pretended to pay. Most of this money's sitting in escrow. This isn't like money that they're going to have to go dig out of their current profits. This was money that was put aside when these permits were put into play. So why not just pay the piper and let's put some dredges out here and backfill all these canals? The dredging projects that we build are, are successful, but it's, it's susceptible to the same forces that are impacting everything else right now. The grounds are still subsiding, so they're sinking. Sea level is still rising. So the projects we build with dredges typically only last about 20 years. So after 20 years, you have to redo the project or move on, right? Even if this lawsuit, the legacy lawsuits, are wildly successful and get billions and billions of dollars, until we're able to get the Corps of Engineers to manage our river and the natural resources it contains differently, that money will, will, will be a Band-Aid uh, versus a, a permanent fix or solution uh, to what's going on here. If money and emissions reductions aren't done in 10 years, the state's going to have to go to a different plan, a dramatic realignment of the lower part of the river south of New Orleans, changing the shipping channel, bringing the mouth of the river much further north, almost to the city. Our oystermen, many are fourth and fifth generation, Oyster growers, they have tons of money and time invested in their, in their oyster farms. Uh, they're diverse, they're, they're spread out, and they have all this on the line here. We have boats, you have docks. If, if, uh, if we can't grow oysters out of Empire anymore, a lot of this that you see here is, is going to be empty. You know, we had, at one time, we must have had 240 you know, licensed fishermen that would sell us. I think we're down to about 70 commercial fishermen that I have right now and selling for us, like selling to us at this dock. It's a fishing community, you know, and it's, uh, it's evaporating, you might say, because the land is gone. My little girl wants everything to do with fishing. It's in her blood and she loves it and she's really good at it. Before oil was ever found, it's been the commercial fishing industry. We feed our country, it's what we do. 
we are the conservationists. When we want responsible, reliable coastal restoration for everyone, and if we can't have it, then we'll fight to our last breath. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.